Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Lauren Marks, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. Steve Usden, Washington Editor. And Simone Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. On this week's pod, all quiet on the ASCO front, Lauren brings us up to speed on the data that matter. The other CRISPR IP case, what you need to know. High-flying Chinese biotech Seastone brings a difficult chapter to a close. And user fees advance in the Senate. We look at how the bill compares with the House version. But first, BioCentury This Week is brought to you by MSD. MSD has a strong history of success in translating cutting-edge research into life-saving medical breakthroughs. The pharma's European Innovation Hub, located in London, is embedded in one of Europe's key scientific communities to drive engagement with local academia, biotech, peer pharma, and venture capitalists. The hub includes a business development and licensing team, clinical teams, and its UK Discovery Research Center. MSD, of course, is also known as Merck & Co. Incorporated. It's located in Kenilworth in the great state of New Jersey. For more information, visit msd.com slash licensing. All right, Lauren, it seemed pretty quiet so far at ASCO, but I know that Marathi published an abstract for its presentation on its KRAS program. What was your takeaway from those data? Yeah, so this was the latest update for Marathi's Adagrasib in non-small cell lung cancer. So we, we keep seeing additional readouts, you know, slightly longer follow-up. And since the beginning of, of the data for this indication, Marathi's program has had slightly higher response rates than Lumacras from Amgen and, you know, consistently, but we've gradually been seeing the gap between these, these two programs narrow. And I think the takeaway from the latest data for Adagrasib, which is under review by FDA right now, suggests that there's not that much of a difference between these two KRAS G12C inhibitors. In our story, we lined up the latest data from Amgen's program, which was two-year data in the indication with the 15-month data for Adagrasib that just came out at ASCO. And they look very similar in terms of response rates and even duration of response. It looks like Amgen's program might be a little bit better. So I think this was disappointing to investors. Lumacross has been on the market for a year now. And Marathi had a setback a couple of months ago when they reported that FDA was not going to review this under the priority review. They were going to have a standard review, which pushes their PADUFA date back to December. And that could have big implications for whether or not Marathi can even go for an accelerated approval in this indication. Because in the meantime, it's possible that Amgen's accelerated approval will be converted to a full approval, which would mean that Marathi's may not be eligible for accelerated approval anymore. The data were still good. They're not shocking but they were not what investors were hoping to see. Yeah, the stock did take a bit of a tumble on the day, but I, I, I think the, the biggest data is yet to come. Is that correct? What are investors really looking out for? What we got last Thursday night was just the regular abstracts. Starting this weekend, we'll start to see the late-breaking abstracts, which will come out on the same day as the presentations. And that's where I think what people are most looking forward to will be the data from inher and Trodelvi in HER2 negative and HER2 low breast cancer, which are very similar indications. And we know that both already met the primary endpoints, but we'll see how they compare uh, with the ASCO data. So let's go back to the KRAS inhibitors for a minute. For people who are you know, not so familiar, obviously this was a target that took forever. It was like identified a long time ago. And there were some breakthroughs, and now we've got a couple of products, one already marketed. So is it really all about just first to market and getting that dominance? Is, is there reason to believe that the actual products will be differentiated based on the way they work? Because they seem very similar to me. So what, what are people kind of looking at? 
I think there were some differences in, in how they bind and how long they stay attached to the target. And there, from the early data, I think there was hope that there, there would be some differences. But there's also, these are dosed differently, once twice a day and once once a day. So that can also help explain some of the differences in the efficacy. But I, I think the take home from the most recent data is that maybe these subtle differences in how these molecules work won't necessarily lead to, to big differences in efficacy or in activity. I think the next big shoe to drop will be the combination data, which will be really important because these are kinase inhibitors. They're not immunotherapies. They're not leading to responses that last for five years. They're pretty short-lived and the combinations are where people are hoping to get a lot more durability. All right. And if you're interested in digging into more on what's happening in breast cancer, tune into the BioCentury show this Thursday. Simone is talking to Laura Esserman of UCSF. She is one of the big people behind the iSpy trials. There's a newer iteration of iSpy, and Simone will be talking to her about how the trial has evolved over time, as well as some other initiatives that she's involved with. And if you're tuning into ASCO, at least the top thing on my list is Simone's conversation with Richard Pazder. Simone, what are you uh, talking to Richard about? I will be in conversation with Dr. Pazder, who is the director of the Oncology Center of Excellence. On Monday, for my sins at 8 a.m. Chicago time, and I think we will cover a range of important topics from accelerated approval to various other initiatives that the Cancer Center has going on. So it is always interesting and dynamic to talk with him. I'm sure you're going to be talking about Project Orbis because you can't have Rick Pazder on without talking about Project Orbis. That's definitely one of them, Steve. And of course, Project Front Runner, a more recent initiative there is, is another one. So we will be checking in on the progress of those, yes. Excellent. All right, Lauren, uh, we've been keeping you busy as always here at BioCentury. In addition to your ASCO coverage, which I invite all our listeners to go on to biocentury.com to check out, you've got a great story on the other patent battle going on in CRISPR. Everyone's been following the uh, big battle between sort of an East Coast, West Coast thing, right? It's Broad versus University of California. I cannot disclose where my allegiances lie, but there's actually another case that's been bubbling along for the past few years. Lauren, can you uh, quickly give us an overview of what the case is, who the players are, and what's at stake? So the, the first interference case between the University of California and Broad Institute was really focused on determining which party was first to invent the gene editing technology for editing human cells, which covers most of the therapeutic applications. But there's also a therapeutic opportunity in using CRISPR to edit bacterial cells. And the, that's where the other patent battle is going on. And there's also an interference in that case. So for these applications, it covers treating bacterial infections and, and treating microbiome-related indications, where in both cases, there's a big benefit in selectively targeting certain bacterial strains. You know, you can avoid killing the rest of the microbiome and help avoid antimicrobial resistance, and there are a couple of companies working in that space. The interference involves patents and patent applications owned by Sniper Biome and Elgo. Lauren, it's really interesting that this technology just continues to spur debate and certainly, you know, action, I suppose, is what I should say. Tell us a little bit more about the actual potential, because I thought that was incredibly interesting. The idea that you could sort of manipulate the microbiome by editing out specific populations of bacteria, or that you could address antimicrobial resistance this way. Because if I understand correctly, that's sort of the, the way that this technology is headed. I do think that is the potential. And something really interesting that, that a couple of these companies are doing is delivering the CRISPR with bacteriophages or bacteriophage-derived delivery vehicles. 
So the idea is that you're getting two layers of specificity and two different mechanisms to kill the bacteria because bacteriophages themselves can be strain selective and can be engineered to be strain selective. And then if you're, you're going after a very specific bacterial target with the CRISPR, um, you know, I think it just has the potential to solve a lot of the issues with the microbiome and, and antimicrobial resistance, commercial challenges aside. All right. Thank you, Lauren. That story, of course, is on biocenter.com. Well worth the read. The next step, I believe, we have one of the companies is challenging the decision by the PTO's PTAB, and we will be following this case. Um, I imagine it'll take uh, some time before it gets resolved. Next up, Seastone. Once on a fast track to become a leading China biotech, the company has found itself in limbo for the past couple of months, ever since mid-March, when the company said deep, deep down in a securities filing to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that it had identified that about $30 million were invested in a separate portfolio company registered in the Cayman Islands. The auditor at the time requested that Seastone hire a big four auditor to sort out the matter. The company was unable to publish its annual report because of that, and therefore its stock was suspended on April 1st. Today, we finally get the results of the company's investigation into the matter. It turns out that a VP at the company, the VP of finance, the company did not have a CFO at the time, recommended an investment in what appears to be an equities fund to the CEO who approved it. The good news for Seastone is that the money is recoverable. It's not all gone. But the question is, and I guess we'll get our first look at this when the stock begins trading again tomorrow, is whether investors still have confidence in the company. After all. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it sounds to me, Jeff, like that was kind of the big question. Yeah, they can get the money back, but can they get people's confidence back? I took a quick peek at the filing that they did with the Hong Kong Exchange this morning. Looks like there's some changes that they're making in addition to saying that they figured out where the money was and they're trying to get it back, right? They're making some management changes. That's right. Uh, the big one is that they are separating the CEO and chairman roles. The CEO since July 2016 has been Frank Jung. He is a pretty big name in China biotech. He's the former head of Asia Pacific R&D at Sanofi. He's a current member of the board of the Drug Information Association, and the company is taking away the chairman title from Frank, and the other move will be to create a new oversight body to keep track of what the company's investments are moving forward. Now, the company shareholders are Wuxi, Boyu Capital, and Pfizer. Pfizer is also a partner. It has a few other big name partners. None of them wanted to talk to me about this, but EQRX, Blueprint Medicines, which is now part of Servier, are a couple of those partners. I guess we'll see where the company goes from here. They're not short of uh, having compounds to develop. They have about 15 compounds, 10 of which are partnered. And in addition to PD-1 and PDL one uh, the company's going after... CTLA4, A2A, and ROAR1. We'll just have to see if they can weather this. So all eyes on uh, CSUN stock tomorrow, and I'll have a story online today about this. All right, Steve, I want to turn to Washington now. We finally have our look at ARPA-H. I know there was a big debate about whether it should be Part of NIH or independent of NIH, where did HHS land on this? Both. 
it's part it's part of NIH and it's independent of NIH. At least that's the theory. What they've announced is that it's it's going to be at NIH. That the announcement was made uh, some time ago, and it's going to be independent of NIH. It was formally established last week. Russell Adams, a former DARPA project officer, was named acting deputy director. The appointment of an acting deputy director was important because under the appropriations bill that created ARPA-H, it was under the control of the NIH director until that position was filled. Now it's filled and ARPA-H is its own entity. There's still a great deal of work to do to stand up the agency. The most important thing, of course, is going to be the appointment of its first director, which is really going to be critical for setting its course. I should note that in addition to filling that job, the Biden administration has got to fill the job of NIH director, and then they're going to have to sort out between them, the, the ARPA-H director and the new NIH director, how exactly it is that ARPA-H can be part of NIH, but um, completely independent of it. I think what it really comes down to is that NIH is going to help them with the paperwork, you know, the HR and um, facilities and things like that. So I was going to ask about that, Steve. So does at NIH mean physically within, you know, NIH up the road from me here in Bethesda? I mean, we know that NCI isn't necessarily at NIH, or is it just a paperwork exercise? And then the other question I have is, is it the NIH director who will appoint the ARPA-H director? Is that Congress or HHS? Whose decision is that? So whether it's going to physically be on the NIH campus or not is yet to be determined. There's quite a bit of lobbying going on in Washington to try to get it put in different locations. The um, congressional delegation from Texas is making a move to put it there. There's also talk about putting it in Cambridge, Mass., or it might end up being either on the NIH campus or in the Washington area. We don't know. As to who's going to appoint the first director of ARPA-H, it's going to be up to President Biden to do that. What's interesting about that, of course, is that the former NIH director, Francis Collins, is serving as the acting science advisor to the president. And one would think that he will have a big say in advising President Biden as to who should be picked for that job. All right, Steve. And uh, what's the latest in the UFA? legislation, the uh, PDUFA bill that's winding its way through Senate, and of course, the companion bill in the House. So it's all of the medical product user fees all packaged together, prescription drug user fees, generics, biosimilars, medical devices. Last Thursday, at a hearing of the Senate Health Committee that was about the infant formula crisis, Senator Richard Burr, who's the ranking Republican on the Health Committee, reiterated his strong and longstanding concerns about FDA's competence and lack of accountability. He said, quote, I'm going to go home and think about whether now is the time to move forward on finishing user fee negotiations and suggested that it might be better to pause them while there's a focus on the infant formula crisis. It isn't clear how the two things are linked. Medical product user fees don't really have anything to do with infant formula, but apparently they are in Senator Burr's mind. That was last Thursday. The next day, May 27, the HELP Committee released its bipartisan user fee legislation. Burr said in a statement, quote, as the committee continues to examine FDA's role in creating and then its failure in solving the infant formula shortage, we must consider whether FDA is capable of receiving even more responsibilities in these agreements when it's clear the agency has struggled with the responsibilities they already have. At the same time, he also said that the enhanced reporting requirements that are in the Senate bill would create more accountability at FDA, and it's possible that that's going to satisfy him and the whole thing's going to move forward. The main differences between the House and the Senate bills are the Senate bill includes the VALID Act. That's a bill that revamps the regulation of diagnostics. It creates a level playing field for laboratory-developed tests and in vitro diagnostics. The Senate bill also includes accelerated approval provisions that are similar to those in the House, and in addition, they create a council that's supposed to coordinate accelerated approval policy across FDA. Some people have made a big deal of this. Personally, I don't think that it is a big deal. I don't think it's going to change a great deal. And what's next? What's next? So the House bill, if you recall, has been passed by the Energy and Commerce Committee. 
it's teed up for a vote of the full House at some point in the, the Senate. The um, Help Committee, when they come back pretty soon, is going to have a markup where they're going to debate the bill that's been introduced and consider amendments. There are a number of amendments that members of the Help Committee are, are going to try to get attached to the bill. Presumably, the Help Committee will pass it out of committee to the full Senate. The timing on that, I think, will depend to some extent on Senator Burr. The hope at FDA and in regulated industry is that they will get this passed relatively quickly. Then they're going to have to reconcile differences between the House bill and the Senate bill, vote on a, a final version of it, get it to the president, get it signed. Everyone who's affected by it hopes that that could happen by early summer. If it doesn't, then at some point, FDA is going to have to notify thousands of employees that their jobs are potentially at risk. And if the whole thing isn't done by the end of the fiscal year, that's the end of September, then there's a risk that really that all hell breaks loose and that FDA can't regulate drugs anymore. Um, I don't think that that's going to happen, but that's the timing. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. And lastly, our colleague Paul Bananos has a story out on GSK's acquisition of Affinivax for $2.1 billion. The deal gives GSK a clinical vaccine for pneumococcal diseases and a platform designed to induce broad, potent immune responses. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you next week.